And Carrie Medora first picked up a needle and thread to make clothing and costumes as a way to satisfy her unique sense of style that began to emerge while she was in middle school. She was fortunate to attend a high school in Massachusetts that offered dressmaking and tailoring classes as electives, and once she started down that path, she never looked back. From making prom dresses and tuxedos for her friends, to costuming the casts of musical theater productions, her passion and talent for sewing and costuming continued to grow. Her interest in historical costuming was cemented after her first trip to Colonial Williamsburg in 1991. After experiencing Williamsburg, Carrie began researching and reproducing historical costume with a primary focus on 18th and early 19th century methods and styles. In the early 2000s, she was the proprietor of Cherry Dawson Milliner, a custom costume business catering to 18th century living historians and Revolutionary War reenactors. Carrie has been sewing professionally and as a hobby for over 25 years and has taught modern dressmaking and historical costuming classes in New England, New York, and Pennsylvania. Her students and clients include Revolutionary War reenactors, staff and volunteers at the Concord Museum, Historic Massachusetts Estate War Place, and Adams National Historical Park. Carrie places a great deal of importance on period construction techniques and attention to detail. From 2007 through 2015, she was on the staff at the Andover Historical Society where she had access to their 35,000 plus piece costume collection and was able to broaden her understanding of mid to late 19th century fashions and construction details. Carrie continued to teach costuming and sewing workshops during and after her time in Andover and continued to build costumes for display and use by living history sites. Today, she is the wardrobe supervisor for the Boston Tea Party Ships and Museum where she is passionate about sewing clothing to help costume interpreters tell the important story of the 1773 event while teaching others to do the same. She also gets to drink unlimited amounts of 18th century tea, which helps <laughs> fuel her costuming plans. Um, please welcome Carrie. Thank you, Ingrid, and thank you to the Newport Historical Society and to the Royal Historical Society for inviting me for this program. Um, was anyone at the Rhode Island Historical Society program? Oh, well, you, you, you were in like, the last five minutes of it, so I can repeat myself without being in too much danger. Um, so, as Ingrid mentioned, I have been sewing and costuming for over 25 years, and um, the high school that I mentioned, or that was mentioned in the um, introduction, is actually still teaching dressmaking. I keep expecting to hear that that teacher has retired, but she has not. Mm -hmm. I go back as often as I can for their yearly fashion show, in fact. Um, the original visit to Colonial Williamsburg was actually with that sewing teacher and really sparked my interest in historical costuming. Since then, it has been a mission, a passion, an interest of mine to dress as they did in the past. And what I've found about dressing in the past is it allows you to get a glimpse and a feel for history that's, that's immediate. We all, I hope, put on clothing every day, right? <laughs> Everyone is here dressed. Um, and when you see someone dressed in clothing from another period, whether it's the 1960s or the 1860s, it immediately makes you wonder, could I wear that? What does that feel like? Are they hot in that? Um, I can't imagine wearing that every day. How do they get dressed? How long do it take to get dressed? And it's something that we can all identify, uh, all identify with. That being said, I also love historical food because we all eat every day too. So <laughs> today we're just focused on the clothing. And what I've brought for you today and what I'll be talking about is what is underneath the outer layers. So the ensemble that I'm wearing um, is roughly about 1835 to 1838. It's all reproduction pieces that I've made. Um, I believe everything, everything that you can currently see um, was hand sewn. As we get to some of the other layers, you'll see some machine sewing. And my general philosophy on that is um, sometimes done is better than perfect. So I will occasionally cheat some of the um, inside seams that typically the public um, or my friends wouldn't see. Um, and I will be passing things around. So any of the reproduction pieces um, that get passed around, you are welcome to fondle and handle and take pictures of. Um, I'll try to interrupt for some questions along the way as well. And then I also did bring a number of original pieces from my personal collection. 
At the end of tonight's program, you are welcome to come up and carefully bottle and touch these and take photographs and ask questions. But much of my study of original clothing and my ability to recreate original clothing comes from looking at the originals. I really have been fortunate to get myself into all sorts of different museums and historical societies um, to look at what people were wearing and look at how things were actually made. So, to start with today, I am going to start undressing. So the first thing gets to go is my enormous hat. A silk bonnet was the crowning feature that a woman, I can hear it again now too, um, it was the crowning feature um, that a woman would wear. My clothing is, for someone of the middling class, a better visiting dress. Um, this is definitely my domain's best clothing. I'm wearing printed cotton. I do have a touch of silk on my bonnet. Now, the clothing from this 1830s period um, really is kind of ridiculous. Can your sleeves get any bigger? Even the 1980s shoulder tabs didn't have anything on this. And in fact, the hair could be almost as ridiculous as well with things like um, arrows and bows and birds sticking right out of top knots on your head. I just brought a bonnet for today, partly because I actually have a quick change into a different decade. But when you see this all together, it's really rather absurd. <laughs> One of the reasons for that is in the 1830s, this is a time of incredible advancement in the arts, in the mechanical arts, and in industrial arts, we're at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. Um, you have more textile mills popping up, access to more printed cottons. You also don't have any nationwide wars. It's a relative time of peace and prosperity. And one of the theories in the fashion world, uh, fashion history world, is that this is where all the extra energy went. <laughs> Big sleeves, small waist, even the men's fashion, if fashions, if you were to look at fashion in the period, the men have fuller hips than, uh, than J-Lo, really. Look at them, they just keep going. And the waist are cinched in, in fact, this is one of the periods where even men are wearing some portrait to really get that cinched in waist. You also have men wearing as bright colors as the women. This is prior to the point where you start seeing a lot of the more somber, serious, three-piece black suits for everyone. So, as we start removing layers, take off the bonnet. <coughs> We're down to a pelerine across the top. This is a fine white cotton one. And someone asked me earlier what, what the purpose of it was. It's really to show off. It's to show off the quality of the fabric. You can see it's very, very sheer. It's also going to show off the quality of my stitching. Fine little hands. This is a time where women had women of reasonable amount of means had the luxury to sew these fine little hands, do all the embroidery. Caveat: I did not do this embroidery. Another one of my cheating. And it also shows off the giant sleeves. Mm -hmm. It all comes back to that: this big silhouette with big hair, big hat, big sleeves, small waist, big skirt. Story of day to keep. <laughs> Now you start seeing some of the shape of the actual gown. Now in this case, um, my gown is all one piece. That's most typical. Mine unhooks um, with hooks and on in the back. In fact, I'm going to ask for volunteer to help out with me. And um, it is has some extra pieces inside helping it stand out. Because as much as my knees are a little bit bony, they're not up that far. <laughs> now the other layers I have on um, are also my cap. The cap, this type of cap, was actually reproduced from a book printed in 1838, um, and it was called a bonnet cap, and it was specifically designed to wear under those big silk bonnets, so you didn't have to do your hair with the crazy bows and arrows and things. And, um, and it's designed to have lots of frills around your face. This is a period where women were trying to look like dainty little babies in, in, um, in cribs. You often will sometimes see three rows of ruffles around the face, all the way around the chin. I will say as a, as a living historian, as someone who does often wear headwear and, and interesting clothing, the caps I find are the hardest to get used to because as I look around the room, I see a couple sunglasses on top of our heads, but we're just not accustomed to wearing headwear anymore. 
especially big white frilly things around our face. So it, it really puts your face in focus in a way that um, we're unaccustomed to today. For the 1830s, that would have been the norm. And in fact, you might have seen three or four rows of ruffles and then ringlets all around your face as well. So framing you with as much proof and frilliness and femininity as they can possibly muster. Now, if I ask for a volunteer, someone help me here. Thank you. There are some hooks at the very top of my gown. That should be. Yeah, I think that's all. Yeah. Perfect. All right. So there are hooks, just three hooks and eyes, holding my gown together in the back. <laughs> they can start seeing some of the others. I have two hooks and eyes at the wrist. Not typically on women's clothing. Most gowns had, uh, most women's clothing had um, hooks and eyes. It's actually quicker and it's sturdier and it doesn't lose up as much materials. So it comes off pretty easily at that point. And I was speaking to someone earlier before the program started. I actually got myself dressed in all of this and dropped my hair up um, in about 20 minutes. So I can dress myself if I need to, but also women weren't living alone. Um, you always had a younger sister, a child, a sister-in-law you don't like so much, um, <laughs> servants if you're of that caliber of uh, society, your mother, your mother-in-law, you're always going to have other people um, living near you that are going to be able to help you get dressed. Same is true even um, I um, hail from next to Lowell, which is well known for its mill girls and the spring up of uh, textile mills in that region. In the boarding houses, the girls would help each other. Um, and so you're, you, you can get dressed very quickly. And although my clothing that you're seeing today is of a little bit finer quality, it's very similar to what would have been worn across all classes of clothing. It's just the lower classes are going to have fewer layers and the material is going to be sturdier and be able to put up with a little bit harder work. And the finer the class of people, the finer the clothing, it's going to be better, better quality. So that's where you're going to start getting into the silks, more delicate whites, um, things that have to be taken care of a lot. You're not going to have the male girls in crazy <coughs> white gowns or um, or colorings for that. Can I just ask what fabric do you have? What, what's keeping the sleeves? So, oh. secret of what is in the sleeves. So if you look inside the top of my sleeve of my gown, there's a little loop, and tied to that are two sleeve puffs. Are they feathers? These particular ones are a, a false stuffing, but goose down would be a typical stuffing. And so what you see inside the sleeves are sleeve puffs. Now, they, by, the, by about 1838, you sort of hit the extreme of these sleeves. So this is, this is designed for that. That being said, the gown looks almost as nice. With no sleeve, with no yeah, button in as well. So many of the gowns were actually, um, as you get into later into the, uh, the decade, they were actually gathered to fit the look. So she might have a little puff at the top, and then all of this would be gathered in, and they'd repurpose the same, the same gown and the same sleeves to carry on to the, um, the most recent fashions. Were all the gowns in that period lined like poses? So it's um, flat lined, so it's two pieces of fabric acting as one. And yes, that is absolutely typical. So you don't have a nice, neat lining like we're custom today. You look inside your jackets and so on, and you can't see any of the guts or seams. This is interlined, or flatlined, um, so you can see the layers working as one. And I will pass around some sleeve puffs. I don't think they're sweaty, but I apologize if they are. <laughs> I didn't have them on that long. You're welcome to try them on. But... <laughs> As I take off the gown, you can start seeing more of the under layers. And you can also see that it's only the bodice that's lined. 
So the skirt is not lined. And one of the reasons for that is that there's going to be lots of layers of petticoats underneath it. In this case, the sleeves are lined, and that happens sometimes in these gowns, and sometimes it doesn't. It really often depends on the, um, on the fabric. In this case, I wanted to have a gown that I could make sure I could wear in cooler weather. Not so much for today, but <laughs> I tend to do a lot of events in the fall, and so it's nice not to have to have extra wraps and cloaks, and just to have a little bit of extra layer um, in the gown itself. Yes? When you said the you still I think so. Mm, no, a couple of views about my machine. That being said, and I'll leave this one up here because it's a little bit bulky to pass around. The waist, uh, the skirt, the way it's attached, it's very, very finely pleated. When I was talking with this about somebody with somebody earlier, and it's a type of pleating known as cartridge pleating or gauging. And so you take two to three rows of hand stitching and you go in and out of the fabric in exactly um, parallel lengths. So if you take a stitch on the top of the fabric for an inch, you go under for an inch, over for an inch, and then you do two um, rows below that. And everything is gathered up. So it performs these perfect, kind of like pinch pleated drapes, these perfect columns. This is just on a very miniature scale. And um, the original gown that I have, This is the original gown from about 1825. Yeah, it's not my um, But this is done exactly the same way. And um, if you look carefully on the inside, you can actually see many of the stitches remain in place forever um, to hold those really fine pleats. Also, hooks and eyes in that. And because this is a little bit earlier, this doesn't have quite the ridiculous sleeve that my gown does, um, but you can see it's starting to form. This was probably um, a few steps down from mine, a little bit closer to a work dress. Also, the sleeves are not lined, only the bodice is, is interlined and done the same way. They did a better job of finishing all of the seams, um, but it's, it's constructed in very much the same way. From the waist up, the next piece I have on is known as the chemisette. Now, prior to this period, I know there's a lot of 18th century history here in Newport. Um, you might see um, you might see something like this filling in. You might see the garment below it. Um, so my sleeves refer to as a shift. The terms start to change shortly after the 19th century, and that's because the the French become more popular. Um, French styles, French terminology. Everyone's kind of jumping on that bandwagon. It's just like today, a black t-shirt from Paris is much cooler than a black t-shirt from New York. Just because it's from Paris. Same black t-shirt. And so it's that same idea happening. And so this small piece that might have been known as a modesty piece or other English terminology becomes known as a chemisette. And it's filling in, for modesty's sake, my, uh, my neckline um, so that I can wear it during the day and not be giving everything away. Oftentimes, the part that is um, below the neckline is a plainer, a plainer cotton. So this is really plain cotton. And then you have a finer frill, so it's a nicer cotton or maybe collar. Um, many times I'll wear a small brooch around it, so it kind of pops the collar up around my neck. Again, lots of white frills around your face. <laughs> you guys getting hot yet? <laughs> <laughs> so now, the layer I have next, is a corded petticoat. And this is a brilliant invention. Prior to this, if you wanted to push out your skirt a little bit, give yourself a more rounded skirt neckline, you'd have to just keep layering and layering and layering your petticoats. In some cases, you might use a quilted petticoat. This goes back to petticoat, quilted petticoats in general, go back to the 18th century. This is a this is a silk satin uh, silk satin petticoat. The date on it is a little bit questionable. It it looks very much like 18th century petticoats, but the waistband is all wrong for that. And unfortunately, there's, I didn't have any. I wasn't given any provenance um, on this piece in particular. But stylistically, it's very similar to 18th century petticoats. And you would layer these upon each other to give yourself that L shape. I know I've seen yeah exactly. 
I've seen records. Now, granted, during um, during the late 18th into the, the dawn of the 19th century, um, we were starting the tail end of the Little Ice Age, and some things were, as a general rule, cooler than um, rather than warmer. But there are some um, there are some diary records of um, women in more northern New England wearing as many 20, wearing as many as 22 petticoats um, for for the, the late 18th century. Um, before you go to the, the Jane Austen Regency silhouette. When you get back into the 1830s, like the gown that I had on, or the 1820s, like my original gown, they wanted to recreate that silhouette. And they were still using some quilted petticoats, because it did the job. Um, they aren't typically as decorative by that period, because they're not meant to be displayed. They're meant to just add layers underneath. Someone, somewhere along the way, came up with the idea of putting some cording in channels, in various places around a petticoat. And this will allow you to have the same thing. And it is so much lighter and cooler, especially on a day like today. Actually, it's not that here. It was 94 degrees when I left Boston today. So. Yeah. Newport has been lovely this afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. And then I'm actually keeping one on. I just wore two to, to, to demonstrate them. Um, but I'll pass this around. This, to be fair, was machine sewn because I don't have that much time, so that much hands on. Yes. No. So it's so as a general rule, um, men were studying a lot of fashions. However, at the tail end of the 18th century, going into the 1790s, when you start having less rigid um, corsetry and the softer kind of, the, the Jane Austen, the Ampere waist, the Napoleonic era that we think of, a lot more women are designing the corsetry and the underpinnings. They're the smart ones. They're the ones that know, I don't want to wear 22 layers of silk and wool to get the right silhouette. So, as with most fashions, things gradually evolved. Um, the 1820s and 30s, things are, getting, things are getting more expansive, more absurd, more oversized, and it was a way to solve a problem. We'll never know who made the first um, corded petticoat. The, um, the cords are just a heavy um, cotton cording. So for the... Um, And you do see some that are corded all the way up, so solid cording. Those ones will stand up on their own. And it's just cotton, so it's cotton organy. Um, the one um, to my left um, is cotton organy that has not been, um, that has, has been either restarched or not laundered. The cotton organy on the right has been laundered but not restarched. Um, so you can also feel the difference. One of them is much softer um, than the other. A non-laundered um, or a restarched organy will really kind of give you that hole. In fact, that one piece that was sort of sticking out from my knee, it's probably because of the way I had it folded, but it, it kept kind of poking out um, right at the front there. So the layers I'm down to now are, um, ignoring my cap for a moment, are my shoes, my stockings, which come up all the way to my knee, my shift, which is the layer that comes down below my knee, and my, um, my stays or my corset. The stays is the term for 18th century corset, corsets, the, um, the triangular um, sort of ice cream cone shaped garments that you may have seen during other programs here. And those are designed to give you a very conical shape. They are not waist cinching. Um, they kind of take whatever excess flesh you have and they push it up or they push it down. <laughs> In a pleasing manner. Kind of right from that, and very focus. By the end of the um, 1700s, going into the 1800s, as I was mentioning, it was women who were doing a lot of the corsetry uh, making. In fact, corsetry is, is an area that I am absolutely fascinated by and have studied in great, in great detail. And, um, and most of my study has been in Boston, to be fair. But looking at the listing of a number of uh, corset makers, and stay makers rather, who are men in Boston, there is not a single woman mentioned in everything through about 1780. Then, by 1789, for the, I think I'm going through the, the say directories, there's something like 45 women corset makers and two male corset makers. And so it's the women who are figuring out, okay, 
our bodies are not meant to fit into ice cream cone shapes. Um, so let's create some softer looks. They, many of these women would have been people who were working with tailors, making those firmer garments. So they knew the construction, but they also knew how women's bodies work. So as fashions changed and you needed a softer silhouette, it was women to the rescue. So the, the corset, and, which is what um, I'm wearing today, the corset is, again, it's a Frenchified term, corset and stays. They pretty much mean the same thing, but the corset is the French term, and that's what eventually takes hold, more popular. So this one is entirely cotton. Yeah, this one's entirely cotton. Um, it's two layers of cotton. Um, there's cotton cording in it, so just like the petticoats that were passed around, these little bits of ridging are just pieces of twine giving it some structure. I do have a couple pieces of metal along the center back, which was not unusual. Um, I have a, a pretty um, hourglass figure naturally, and if I tried to just pull in fabric, it would all bunch up. So I needed something to keep this length um, from, from cinching in. And then I also have a wooden bust here, so you can hear it. <laughs> and this changes the silhouette. So this, when it's fit properly, it pushes into the center. It actually goes sort of almost rests against the breastbone. And your friends are lifted and separated. You can sort of roll back um, from the cups of the cups of the corset. This is actually the most, of all the corsets and stays I own, this is actually the most comfortable one. Um, it's, I can breathe in it. There's not a lot of extra boning. You can see it kind of squishing in at my waist. It's kind of wrinkly there. This is not binding me at all. Um, is, that, is that separate from the skirt? It is, yes. Yeah. It's very close in color, but yes. Yep. Yeah. And I'm going to take off the, the uh, corset in just a moment. And um, so it's a very soft garment, but it is a very supportive. I'm not saying I want to do jumping jacks in this. It's not quite good for going to the gym. But, um, but it is really supportive. I can wear it all day long without, without any complaints. It's also very adjustable. Ideally, a corset or stays, you want to have a gap in the middle. I've been fortunate, I lost a little bit of weight the last couple of months, so that's kind of sneaking in, and it's almost getting to the point where it's too big, um, because you need tension. So anytime you watch a historical costume movie, and you see them lacing up the corset, and they're lacing it edge to edge, they're doing it wrong. Now you all know, there actually should be space in the back, because you need that tension to create the shape. You'll see it much better in my, my later corset, um, when I get that on, because that one still has quite a bit of room. So, typically, I would take the time to lace and unlace this, but I'm going to cheat. I'm going to cut the bottom cord because it's much quicker to do a quick change. Okay, okay those are the scissors that didn't work. Sorry, Elizabeth. So, is it knotted? It is knotted. And what are you doing? I'm cutting the cord. You're cutting I'm cutting the cord. <laughs> So I do have it um, because it's more than it takes too long, and I don't want to keep it here all night. So it starts lacing at the bottom. That's what I just cut, and it laces one strand laces from the bottom all the way to the top. And then when I'm dressing myself, I take the extra and tie it around myself a few times. Sometimes put it in place, and then just do a knot. Because I'd like to get rechanged and redressed for you rather quickly, um, what I did was cut the short end of the lacing. Now, can you get into that yourself? Yes, I got myself dressed in this entirely. Like I said, the outfit that you saw me in to start the program, the only thing that I did not do was the very last hook um, on the top of the gown. So everything else I'm able to get it to. I just I'm not double jointed enough to yeah. get that last get that last hook. So. Um, so um, I'll take, up, take the course off in just a minute. Um, but the, the last layer is um, the shift. This is what's always more and closest to your body. This has not changed radically since the 1600s. It's your linen, your, your body linens. One of the reasons for it being linen is linen launders really, really well using historic techniques. Linen boils, 
Um, you can get it really clean, you can lay it out in a grassy area, it bleaches it beautifully. Linen also gets softer and softer and softer the more you wash it. And it's a naturally wicking um, material, so it pulls the sweat away from you if you're in Boston when it's 94 degrees and, and on the, the tea party ship. So it's, it's a great fiber for that. Um, as the fashions change, what you see slight changes to are things like sleeve length, the cut of the neckline, but for the most part, it's a big T-shaped garment um, that comes down really usually past your knees. When I don't have everything tied on, it would drop a little bit lower. And that is what's worn closest to your body. Most women, even the, the lower sort, are going to have several. It's also typically the same garment you're going to sleep in. So you have one during the day, change into a fresh one at night if you're fortunate, change into the next one, um, another one the next day. So you have enough to go for a couple days. Yes? Maternity. So maternity. Good question for the, the states. Um, so shift doesn't change for, um, for the, the period of, um, of gestation. Um, the stays get laced looser and looser, honestly. So that by the end, I think we have someone here that could have demonstrated that earlier, um, the stays end up just kind of popping and riding over the belly. You do see some stays that um, have um, some uh, lacing where the gussets are that fit my hips um, to give you a little bit more space, but typically it laces, it just moves over. So if you look at, um, especially satirical prints, because the pregnancy wasn't sort of glorified the way it is um, today, it, you, you tend to see um, maybe what's supposed to be like someone's mistress walking by with like all of her skirts are way shorter in the front and it's sort of pulling out the guy you know, in uniform coat off to the side and stuff. So if you look for that where the, the aprons or things seem unnaturally hot in almost any period, it's usually because they're trying to indicate some pregnancy and you get this sort of weird shape going right down the front. I should mention, because um, I don't have a great example, that the ideal for this period is still pretty flat fronted. As we jump ahead a couple of decades, um, actually having you know, a, a natural woman's belly is really embraced. In fact, there's this particular type of front of it that is called a spoon bus. And it actually is designed to, um, to accentuate the roundness that most of us have below the waist. Um, this period, not so much. You have a piece of ash right down the front. <laughs> so um, I'm going to take a quick drink of water, talk about Mr. Tulsa for a minute, and then I'm going to another volunteer to help me see in. And we are going to suddenly jump ahead 40 years. So this is 1830s. Um, if you'd like, I'm just going to. Any questions while I. Mm -hmm. So the hoop. So we started in the 1830s, we're going to jump ahead to the 1870s and skip over the <laughs> um, The reason for that is twofold. <coughs> One, I can only fit so much stuff in my car. Um, and two, um, it's, these show sort of the two extremes. So you're seeing elements of the hoop in the, um, the corded petticoats. Um, it is a man who invents the hoot, um, the steel cages as they're known. It's basically the corded petticoats without um, fabric in between them and using steel um, to replace the, I'm sure case, replace the cord. Um, the whalebone is one of the major stiffeners. It's not typically being used in the hoops. You do see whalebone or baleen being used in some of the stays in corsetry. You don't see much being used in this period. Um, I overheard someone saying earlier um, about how basically we, uh, we being women, um, and those of us buying clothing, um, decimated the whale population. That's absolutely true. Um, part of it was for the whale oil, part of it was for the baleen um, that was used to put into all the corsetry. It was also put into many pieces of clothing. So it wasn't even just the undergarments. Many of the later pieces of clothing actually had whalebone in the structure of the gown and sometimes even the, um, the skirts itself. Um, also in umbrella and parasol spokes, um, so it's being used, and so it was a fairly brilliant man, I'll give him credit, um, for developing that steel cage that sort of took some of the pressure off some of the other materials as well. So any questions before we skip ahead four years? Come and come back. Yes? Um, the women wearing underpants, and how did you keep the socks? 
so. So, um, no. And, um, and you have garters tied around, um, so usually like a 30 inch piece of ribbon or, um, or tape that you tie sort of twice around your leg and tie them to go. Um, I have modern stockings. They're, they're still knee high, but there's enough um, ribbing in them that these ones actually stay up on me, so I do not need garters. But most um, stockings would not have stayed up quite so nicely, so a lot of pieces of ribbon would do that. And as far as the underwear question, well, technically, this is my underwear. Um, but if you're talking about a lower body garment that just covers uh, certain parts, um, no, it wasn't a thing. It does start to become a thing as we jump ahead a few decades. And um, when you have uh, pieces cinched around your waist and lots of layers, it's not a practical garment. Um, so in fact, you'll see that even some things that we would sort of think of falling into the underwear category um, are completely crotchless. So they're more to protect your legs and to give you some sense of modesty, but you get flipped head over heels, it doesn't protect anyone from seeing everything that you have. So. All right. So I'm also keeping um, this petticoat on purely for modesty's sake. Typically, all this will be done just over. I don't want to put these on upside down. Um, it would be done just over um, a shifter shoes. So what I have now, jumping ahead to the 1870s. So we're about 40 years in the future. We'd still have a shift or possibly a chemise because the French have taken hold, or sometimes a smock. And this one is typically a little bit more shaped. It's also a little bit more decorative. This one is also cotton. Cotton starts to be king um, in the 1850s and 60s. Um, and so cotton starts to become more prevalent for those undergarments. Cotton just becomes, it's cheaper, thanks to Eli Whitney and the cotton gin. Um, it becomes much more readily accessible. You also tend to have shorter sleeves because a lot of the gowns start having several different bodices that can go with one skirt. And one of those might be a ball or evening bodice. Um, so you'd need some shorter sleeves and some flexibility underneath that. You don't need the longer sleeves um, that we needed before. So I'll pass this around. You also have the invention of sewing machines by this period. So everything you see here will be constructed by machine, but you may have some details added by hand. Now rather than the corset that I had on earlier, this one laces or closes and opens in the front and the back. The front piece, these metal pieces, are referred to as a busk. They're sold as a pair. They're basically metal hooks and knobs, and they set right into each other, so it's really quite snug. The fitting comes when you start lacing up the back. Now this one, um, unlike the 1830s corset, which had one lace that went from bottom to top, this corset has really almost two sets of lacing. It has a double lace that starts from the bottom and laces like your sneakers up to the waist. And then it has the same thing starting from the top and going down to the waist. Why does it stop at the waist? So you can get the most amount of tension as possible, so you can get that exaggerated small waist. This is the period just after the hoops where you have the extreme, um, you hear the limited reports of corsets breaking ribs and rearranging women's innards. That wasn't actually the case. That tended to be you know, the, the satire and men mocking women's fashion in general. But it was accentuating the waist. What happens more often is that, yes, you'd pull it tight, but then you'd actually start patting out your hips. So you'd give the illusion of a smaller waist just by making everything else bigger. Uh, it's a trick we could also then confront it. So can I get a volunteer to help me? It's not scary, I promise. Okay, thank you. This one I cannot get into easily myself. I can do it, it's just it'll be much quicker to help. 
So there's two places that are free. Okay, so if you could give me the top ones. Wait, I hope. Nope, just I'm going to take them over my shoulder and get them out of the way. And then, just like a sneaker, you're going to start kind of lacing it up from the bottom. And I'm actually going to face you, can see this. Well, I'm blocking the way, okay? Well, we'll switch sides. Are you going to do from the top? No, I'm gonna, you're going to do from there to the waist. Okay. And those okay, strings. Go. This one goes pretty tight. Was that my costume made for these or for was there a factory that oh, it yeah, it goes really tight. Yeah, I have to I have to loosen it up pretty big to get it on, but it, it goes pretty tight. Um status, our corsets were both custom made and there were factories made. Right, you want me to go real tight for you? Yep. Okay. <laughs> wow. Oh my gosh. I'm also I to be fair, I'm pretty fortunate that I have just like a fleshy body. This is what happens when you don't go to the gym. You don't go to the gym. No, no, no. This is what happens when like you don't go to like your your core Pilates classes and you're you're just soft. Um, everything kind of squishes. What's that? This one is silk satin. Yep. Right. So this has got to be you, right? Okay. Yep. So this one is good. Yeah. Okay, so, so if you could cross them once. Okay, get you tight. Well, we'll cross it once the, once the top one is done. We'll, okay, and so cross them once and then hand them to me. Okay, you don't have to pull it anymore. <laughs> now, you're going to, now you're going to do the same thing in the top two. It's because yeah, so it's yeah, so it's it opens in the front. And so I'm keeping tension on what she's already laced. This one you don't do yourself. I can, it just it takes me a long time. I can't do it. I also can't get it as tight as somebody else lacing it for me. It's also um during this period, by the 1870s, women of uh, even, um, I'd say, sort of lower middle class, the kind of all ranges of middle class and certainly upper class, are going to be changing more than once a day. So it's not that you just put your clothing on in the morning and then take it off at night. You might be changing for visiting, you might be changing for clothing, for, um, for cooking, you might be changing for chores. If you're, even if you're working in the mills, there's a chance you might have to oh change. Oh my gosh, it just goes really tight. It does. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And yes, I can still breathe. I can still yell. Right. You only go as tight as it can go, right? Not. No. I mean, it shouldn't. It really shouldn't be touching. Yeah. No. There's. There's always a guy. Nice one, really good. Yeah. Yeah. Can you guys say over there? Really go as tight as it can go. And you can see the shape of my body changes. It's still the same body that was in the other half. Wow. This is a lot of work. So, so assuming most people have seen Gone with the Wind, um, Vivian Leigh did actually get down to an 18 inch waist for that. Um, 18 inch, yep. Um, and there are extremes of every fashion. Um, this is like this is still really comfortable for me. Um, I know we haven't quite finished from the top down to my waist. What happens is you you lace to kind of the almost. Oh, this is a lot of work. Really. <laughs> I'm sure they had a gal with a little bit they, yes, yes. yes. And they probably did it so fast yes. to the fact. Yes. <laughs> but this is not easy. Your, your apprenticeship is on very well. Oh my, oh, I'm really making this beginning. Oh my gosh. All right. Um, okay. You want to just stop there? That's no, no, no. Okay, so you're going to cross that one. Okay. And hand it to me. <laughs> wow. Thank you. 
No, the cords are high. Um, not not so much. I mean, you definitely didn't. <laughs> you definitely didn't have. Um, they didn't have showers. So that's okay. That's okay. Put your round of applause for my friends. That's hard. Um, 
that wasn't a thing. Um, you do tend to see for middling class and, and certainly upper class, you have more um, small meals throughout the day until you're sort of late <coughs> piece. And again, women are eminently practical creatures. They're going to find a way to, um, to get everything they need. Um, we all know that there's a, an obesity epidemic. We're all eating too much these days. Um, anyway, people were typically thinner then. Um, so they actually needed fewer calories, and most people were getting better quality calories than we're getting today. From an experimental uh, archaeology point of view, as someone who has worn this type of clothing off and on, um, when I was doing reenactments on a very regular basis, where I was wearing this clothing for you know three straight days at a time, um, my waist stayed smaller during that period. Um, I didn't eat as much. Um, I did naturally have less of an appetite. I never felt famished. I was never, I, I've never been uh, guilty of looking like I was starving. Um, but I do find that like my waist, my waist stayed at a smaller size, even though I wasn't wearing it every day. But I'd wear it, put it on Friday night, take it off Sunday night, and just the act of spending, you know, two and a half, three days in this clothing where my appetite's a little bit more restricted and it's compressing my waist, that was translating to the other you know, four to ten days in a row that I didn't do that. Um, so I think there's probably, some of that was happening, just, you, you can only eat so much before you feel full in this. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yes? Um, you said women would own several shifts. Mm -hmm. How many corsets would a woman own? So typically one or two. Um, you don't, as you start getting later into <coughs> the, um, later into the 19th century, so by this period, you might see a third, but typically you have, it's like your one good bra. You go to that every time you have it mended and repaired um, and until you need to replace it. Um, so in most of the inventories I've looked at through, um, at least through the early 1870s, that's still pretty typical um, that you might have your good corset and then your old corset. Um, so yeah, it's, and the other thing is that the, the corsets, these are not typically getting laundered and they're not absorbing as much, they're not absorbing your body oils. Um, because of the shift and everything, it's not actually touching your body anywhere. You do start to see some wear and discoloration um, from perspiration at the top here. Those are areas where there's not a lot of boning and it can easily be repaired with some, with some additional fabric. And that tends to be where you see the most wear um, on those as well. Okay, so that's layer up on this one. So the first thing I'm going to need is my bustle. So as I mentioned, we've skipped right over the big round hoops. And now, all the way up. <laughs> so these do, this does have a steel cage, or it has steel boning um, in it to give it that shape, but it's actually still quite flexible. So I can sit down, this is a collapsible bustle. <laughs> that really was what it was called. Um, but this allowed me to sit down. Um, I also, from a personal point of view, I find this period just easier to maneuver in. Part of the, um, a lot of people love the appeal of the big bustles and watching Gone with the Wind and King and I and all of those. A lot of modern houses and buildings are not built for skirts that way. So it's like just trying to get through doorways or go upstairs, you just, you feel like you're knocking over small children. <laughs> um, this at least it's sort of all in the back, and I have some cushions, so if I bump into anybody, I'm not actually going to knock them over. <laughs> so the first thing is, so the first layer of underpinnings is the um, is the the collapsible bustle, and then because that's not quite enough on a shelf, I'm going to add a small bustle pad. <laughs> and again, everything would be sort of anchored underneath the corner of the corset or a small hook. And part of that is because once I start piling skirts on top of here, everything is going to want to ratchet back. And so this keeps things anchored. Um, so my bubble. Were those designs from France also? Some of them were. But um, fashion, actually, fashion in 1870 is a lot of it is coming from France. But London is still a major player, um, as is New York and Philadelphia. Is that 
find comfort. <laughs> you do a lot of perching. Um, so yeah, so you sit on the edges of chairs, um, the very edge of the chair. So um, I can't easily sit like a larger wingback chair. I'm fine with or a solid. Um, a solid hardware chair, like I wouldn't dare try to sit in one of these folding chairs because I'd have no sense of where it is. Um, I have taken some um, historical etiquette lessons. Um, one of the best ones, and it's, it's handy, um, I don't know if we all have to go meet the queen, I guess, um, is one of the things that would do, one of the tricks that, that would be used is if you needed to, to sit down, you would sort of back into your chair until you could actually feel the chair with the back of your leg. So you actually knew where that front edge of the chair was before you tried to sit down. So you could kind of steady yourself and then sit because you really are trying to catch the front edge of the chair. This is not a period for like falling deeply into, into, the, into the seat. So if you're looking at my, um, my bustle pad and my bustle, you can see it has some pretty hard lines on it. It's pretty, very rigid. And so we want to put a petticoat on over that. This is actually an original petticoat, and it's one of the few pieces in my collection that I actually wear. And part of the reason for that is that these white petticoats are the equivalent of men's white t-shirts. Every historical study has dozens of them. There, I mean, every woman would have had several in her collection. You can find these for a few dollars in antique stores very, uh, very often, and most of them have no inter interesting story or provenance. This one has a few little holes here and there, but other than being an everyday garment, it has not a lot of historical significance. So although my general rule is to not wear historical clothing, this piece was probably just going to get thrown away or turned into rags otherwise. So. Did those ever have pockets? Not typically. Earlier periods did, but this period didn't so much. Um, you do sometimes have pockets on the outside of the gown, um, but more typically a woman is carrying a bag. You don't see a lot of pockets. Not never, but you don't see a lot um, in the, the, current, the clothing of this period. So you can see the petticoat is softening those lines now, and there's a lot more gathering of the petticoat in the back, because again, it needs to go over a bigger area from the front to the back. I'm sorry, good question. Um, when would you have that cage sewn into a gown? The collection that, that I volunteer in, we have several dresses of the 1880s that have those metal strips mm -hmm. and their ties that create that, that back so, so there's two bustle periods. There's what's referred to as the first bustle period, or early bustle, and later bustle. These really are the technical terms. <laughs> the early bustle period is roughly um, 1871 to about 1877. Um, and then they decide that bustles and bums aren't in, and they go to what's known as natural form, and it's a much longer, straighter, still a little bit of emphasis in the back, but longer, straighter um, styles. And then the bustle comes back with a vengeance around 1782 through, um, through in the mid to late 1780s. The bustles for that period, I mean, sorry, 18, 1880s, sorry. Too many different centuries. Um, yeah, so all of that was 18. Um, so the, the early bustle is 1870s, um, then it goes to natural form, and then 1880s, it comes back with a vengeance. And the bustles of the 1880s are, if you think this is shelf life, the 1880s have nothing on that. Like it's 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 incredible. It goes straight out. You could put an entire coffee service on top of it. <laughs> and so that would be when they're seeing you need more structure in some of the gowns themselves. So they would still probably have a bustle, a separate bustle underneath, and then that's adding extra support to it. It's very similar. I mentioned that whalebone is sometimes sewn into the, the bodices of gowns. It's the same idea. You still have the corset underneath, but the whalebone in the bodice itself is really reinforcing those fitted straight lines. So the steel hooping sewn into a gown would be reinforcing the um, ridiculous bustles in the 1880s. So yeah, so I can't say I'm surprised. surprised yeah. So petticoats um, are going to soften those lines. Sometimes you might see a second petticoat as well. Um, but I think I'm going to stop there. That's all I got. 
So after that, ooh, you know what? I forgot I still have the silly cap on. Let's take that off. Caps are not so much a thing for the 1870s, unless you're sleeping. What you do tend to see is hair twisted up in lots of larger loops. This is the heyday of false hair. Um, you're buying huge lengths of it. For anyone who's read Little Women and Joe selling her hair, this is close to that period. And there's just crazy top knots and braids, and it's the equivalent of like a whole other person's head of hair <laughs> twisted up in there. So the last bottom layer.
And having um, having retouched, like I said, I actually just like literally a half an hour before I got here, I touched up all the pleats on this, um, and then just the just bringing them over, having to put them back in the bag, they got a little bit messed again. Um, but having done all the pleats for this in the first place, and then having touched it up for a number of different wearings, um, my hat is off to all the laundresses of the 19th century. That is, I, uh, I do not I do not envy in the days before electric irons. When you actually had to heat up irons um, on, you know, on a fire or coal stove and control that temperature and try to set miles and miles of these pleats, um, these ones are actually they were set with a, a vinegar spray so that it actually holds its shape a little bit longer, so I can go longer stretches without without having to touch them up, and they re, they kind of bounce back to their original uh, their original shape. Um, but yeah, the amount of care that went into laundry. Yes. So there's a couple tricks. Um, the cleaning did happen. Most most of the cotton gowns um, would be um, would be cleaned just like everything else. They'd be boiled, um, boiled and washed. The um, they did more to prevent the dirt on the undersides of their skirts in the first place. So there were different. Um, equivalents of like dust ruffles. So it's a layer of um, layer of ruffles. So if you think of can everyone, everyone picture a can can skirt, like all those ruffles inside that. So imagine if you put all those layers of ruffles um, on the underneath side of a train. All of those ruffles would pick up the dirt, pick up the dust, and it actually allows your skirt itself to float above that. You can unbutton the dust ruffle, wash that, put it back on, change it for different gowns, replace it if need be. So they did a better job, than, certainly than I have, of actually just keeping their, their gowns out of the, the muck and the dust in the first place. And apparently more buttons. So, yes, they are. They are. So there we have, we have jumped. We have jumped 40 or so years into the future. We're now 1870s, completely appropriate for um, being in Newport. Although I have been told Providence was far more um, ahead of the game by 1870s. We should probably take a talk. What's that? There is a one back. Quite foppish 
during that period. If you go back even further um, to the um, to the late uh, mid to late um, 18th century, um, some of the some of the court suits and the the velvet and silk suits the men are the men the men are wearing um, are stunning, and they're not more elegant than the women's, but they are certainly on par. And, um, and in fact, um, Massachusetts, um, eight or ten institutions in Massachusetts got together for the year 2018 to do Massachusetts fashion history. So if you are so inclined to leave your lovely state and head north for a couple different visits, um, there are a number of different fashion exhibitions coming to different places in Boston. Um, right now there's one at the Concord Museum. Um, one of the ones I'm most excited about is coming to the MFA in Boston, and it's the, um, it's the story of Casanova. And so it's going to be very 18th century focused, and Casanova being Casanova and having traveled all over, um, there should be some spectacular clothing on display for that. <laughs> The so Peabody Essex, their contribution to the, um, the events was the Georgia O'Keeffe exhibit, which I'm not sure is still up. So they had a lot of her sewing tools and sewing kits and things like that, but it wasn't, it wasn't as, um, the historical fashion didn't go as far back. So there's something at the Concord right now. There's something at the Concord, yeah, I'm actually going to see it next week. Um, yeah, it's, that one is um, fashionable goods shopping for... Shopping in a given town or something, but it's 1750 to 1900. Google it. What, what is it? The Concord Museum or the? Yes, it's the Concord Museum. But I think if you Google Mass Fashion History, um, it should it should come up there as well. There's also a great 18th century, 17th and 18th century exhibit coming to um, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, that's coming in July or something too. That's all about um, Versailles, um, but they're pulling in a lot of their um, their period costumes. I'm sorry? Where is that coming? The Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. So, which you guys are much closer to coming from here. So, um, so do, are there any questions? Yes, okay, we'll start in the back here. Um, I wonder if in your travels you come across any information about how women protected themselves from the So, uh, yeah, the question always comes up. Um, so the question was, um, how did women deal with menstruation um, in, in different periods? And we, um, there's different schools of thought. Um, one of them is that um, basically women would have claws that would be pinned to the front and back, whether it's like anchoring to the bottom of their corset or stays um, underneath their shift. So um, that would be one, uh, one possibility. There are, um, there, there's no, I haven't been able to see any records of anything similar to um, a belt, so nothing that hung from the waist. And again, when you think about how this clothing is, is going on, having anything around your waist at your bottom most layers is going to be really difficult to work around. Um, I will treat you to the demonstration I did the last one. When someone asked how you to actually use the toilet. Um, I won't actually do it, but um, but one of the you know one possible way is is to go like this, and so you squat front style because you're using chamber pots. It's also easier to lift a leg up and to go that way as well. So you're you are you are open for the most part from from the knees up. Um, you have easy access, so you wouldn't generally want anything interfering with that. You wouldn't want anything hanging from your waist underneath. In fact, when I occasionally costume people, they often will want to wear tights um, or stock or uh, waist high stockings. So I'm like, that's a mistake. You won't be able to get to that. So it's like for anyone. So imagine wearing spikes. <laughs> so it's like you, you can't get to what you need to once all your other layers are on. That being said, a couple of the other. Um, uh, period pieces, I got, so original pieces I have. So there are what we think of as underwear. There we go. So these are drawers. These are a little bit later. These are um, actually more like Titanic era. Drawers, yep. Like under drawers. And 
these are closed, which means they would typically be worn over the stays. So you would undress, you wouldn't have them laced tightly underneath the stays, you'd have your shift or chemise tucked into them, so you would have to do a little bit of unbuttoning. They unbutton really easily on both sides, so you can kind of drop trial basically and take care of what you need to take care of. That being said, this is an original pair with no crotch. <laughs> this you could put underneath your you can put underneath your um, corset uh, because you don't actually need to get at your waist until you're done for the day. But if you're um, so in a day when you have broader skirts. Um, especially some of the bigger hoops, because the hoops start to come in in the 1850s, and they don't go out until the late um, 60s into the early 70s. Um, so you have this kind of big bell around you. So if that comes up or catches some wind or something, you'd want something to protect your knees from being scandalous. So it's really what it is. It's sort of to keep anything from being seen, um, and so that no one would get a glimpse of the bell. No one would get a glimpse of your I love your thoughts. <laughs> Parasol, sometimes both. Um, the hats for this particular period are not particularly useful. They're, they're really more of an ornament, um, so they're not going to provide you much sun protection. They're, um, they might be tilted very far forward on the head, so you get a bad tan line. <laughs> um, but they're, they're not going to provide much protection. It's really interesting looking at some of the accessories that go along with different periods. So for the 1830s, that has the really big hat, the really big sleeves, the really big skirt, tiny little parasols. Same thing for the Civil War period when you have the big hoop skirts, tiny little parasols. Sometimes they're only um, they're only about 18 inches across. What good that served? Then again, they had bonnets that were close to their heads, so that was giving them more actual protection from the elements. Um, for this period, you have more decorative hats, and um, and definitely lots of lots of parasols being used. So, any other questions? Yeah. Have you ever heard of a peeking frame? Not a peeking frame, no. Like a little wooden. I've seen different kinds of tools that enable you to pleat more quickly and more evenly. Okay. Um, not referred to as a frame. Um, it's something that I'm aware of going back at least to the beginning of the 20th century. I don't know how far it goes back before that. One of the things I did mention is that although by this period the gowns are being machine sewn, which allowed you to make the gowns and the, the skirts and petticoats much more quickly, all of this trimming gets done by hand. So it's like they make up for the fact that they had machines to put things together, and they go overboard with the trick. Um, so when you think of the Victorian, this is, this is sort of mid-Victorian era, when you think of that Victorian era and just the opulence and the trims upon trims and pleats and ruffles and ribbons, uh, that typically is getting applied by hand. Now the pleats themselves, there are different sewing machines that will actually create those pleats. And those sewing machines do go back to that period. Um, they were very specialized machines. So you have one machine that just did nothing but setting certain width pleats, um, one that set certain um, types of gathers. Those weren't home machines. That would be for dressmaking shops and so on, and a larger scale. Um, but so some of that would be done by, by machine, but then every bit of this is attached to the actual garment by hand. Um, so that's what allowed them to add layers upon layers of the different trims as well. <laughs> Yes. So the shoes I have on, this is part of what I can add to my quick change. Um, the shoes that I have on are reproduction 1830 shoes. Yeah. So these are these are a cotton sateen. One of these days I'll get around to actually dyeing them. Um, these are made by a company out in um, Nevada called American Duchess. They specialize in reproduction shoes. These are, are very typical, having a square toe, but also very flat for the 1830s. Um, and you often would see these dyed to the color of a dress, um, or black. This is very, very common. You also see many of them with laces, um, with ribbons crisscrossing around the ankle. Also, too much information, I have fabulously thick Polish ankles. 
<laughs> and ribbons around my ankles do not look good. So I, they don't, they just don't stay up. I've never had dainty ankles. Um, so I wear them without any ribbons. But if you or happen to look at any fashion plates in the 1830s, you'll see this style in a majority of them. Square, um, square vamp, square toe, completely flat, color to match the gown, or black. Um, so these are pretty utilitarian. The shoes that I probably should be wearing with the, this 1870s ensemble um, look much more like modern shoes. So they're, they're um, typically pumps are, um, are what's worn, so a small heel, usually a slight squash heel, so a little bit of shaping, but not too much, and one to two inch. You also would see lots of boots. This is a period of both button-up boots as well as lace-up boots. And that's what would be worn on a more typical daily basis. And you have pumps or um, the, the nicer uh, dress shoes um, for going promenading or going to evening events. But boots were kind of the mainstay um, for the 18, 1860s and 70s. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Yes. That's an excellent question, and you do see some short boots um, of leather for the 1830s. Definitely by the 1870s, there's good solid like, ankle to mid-calf length boots. Um, but for the 1830s, you see small booties, like more at the height of an ankle boot um, that we have today, that'd be more practical. Um, so that would have been that would have been good. Could you talk about gloves and when they would be worn and would not be worn? So gloves would be worn almost all the time, honestly. Like pretty much unless you're at the home. Um, you have numerous sets of gloves. Gloves are not expected to last very often. The dress gloves you have for going to evening affairs might only last one or two wearings. Um, but you'd also have regular gloves, just like we, we typically wear for winter. You'd have numerous pairs of gloves that would get you just from place to place. So they're much more protective of their skin, um, and, and there was just a, a larger level of clothing that was, that was being used. You have all those accessories. It was just part of what everyone was accustomed to, um, that I, I really enjoy my yoga pants and, and fleece, you know, um, as well. But there was a certain expectation that you would follow what everybody else was doing, and that meant gloves when you left the house that meant a cap if you were a married woman leaving the house earlier in the decade, um, a fashionable hat later in the decade, um, keeping her all to you know to shield you from the sun and so on. What has been true until really I would say 1930s, 40s, um, is that the paler your skin, the more high class that appeared because you did not have to be looking outside. So until we got sort of the dawn of the sunbathing um, and you know being wealthy enough to go on holidays in the Mediterranean and so on, um, you wanted to be as pale skinned as possible. Um, and so wearing gloves, using the parasols, wearing the bonnets, using the modesty pieces, all of that to cover up as much as possible would be a part of that process. And um, it's just sort of what you did every day. Um, not that there weren't always, you know, not that there weren't rebellious women and women setting fashion trends like Amelia Bloomer and sort of the reform movement, which is calling for no corsets and much more comfortable clothing. Um, but that was a very small subset. It wasn't the majority. Um, would you just repeat, did you say caps were worn by unmarried women? So, uh, I'm sorry, actually, should be married women. For the 1830s, you see, um, you see older women, um, older women and married women wearing caps. Younger girls, sorry, did not wear caps, typically. So, anyone else? Well, thank you all. Very